Hello, Overcomers, and welcome to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. I am Runsi, the founder of Overcome, and today we are joined by two very special guests, Dr. Lois Ramondeda and Smita Malaya. So Dr. Ramondeda is professor at MD Anderson, where she provides surgical and chemotherapy-directed patient care while co-leading the MD Anderson HPV cancer prevention effort, as well as serving on the American Cancer Society HPV. HPV Roundtable. In 2019, Dr. Amandeda became a certified yoga teacher and is now exploring new methods to further enhance her patient-centered holistic practice. Joining her today is Smita Malaya, and she is a mind-body intervention specialist at MD Anderson Cancer Center's Integrative Medicine Program. Smita has a master's degree in yoga therapy and has been practicing yoga for over 18 years. So there is just so much to learn from uh, both Dr. Amandita and Smita about the benefits of yoga therapy in overcoming ovarian cancer. So grab your favorite coffee or your beverage. I have mine. And just uh, let's connect over coffee with uh, both of them for the next 45 minutes to an hour. As we And uh, if you have any questions as we go along, please type in the comment sections below as we get to know more about yoga therapy in ovarian cancer. So with that, a warm and huge welcome to you, uh, Dr. Ramandeda and Smita, to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. Uh, such an honor to have you both with us. Thank you so much, Rincy, for having us. We're, uh, we we uh, actually enjoy doing talks like this and sharing what we've learned and hope that it will be a benefit to your to your audience. And this is such an important to topic too. So, so thank you for joining us. So, you know, uh, lots of questions in my mind, but just to start us off, uh, I just wanted to know what your definition is of yoga and why is it important on a physical, emotional, and spiritual level? Great question. Uh, and I say it's a great question because uh, we actually have sometimes a hard time accruing people to our yoga trials because of like preconceived notions of what yoga is. And many people are like, oh, I don't want to get hot. I don't want to get sweaty. I can't, I'm not flexible, all of these things. And that um, is a very narrow definition of yoga. Uh, that really actually is only one of the eight limbs of yoga per Patanjali, which is a very old text that talks about what yoga is. So what is it to me? Um, it incorporates lifestyle, uh, how you are with yourself, how you are with other people, how you withdraw from all the chronic constant information that's coming our way and how you connect in a way to the things that are truly meaningful for you um, so that you can make clear decisions uh, to have the most peaceful um, and hopefully blissful state of mind. And that does require, to some extent, a healthy body, which you get through proper breathing and movement and eating and sleeping. And so that's, it's all of that. So it is physical. It is mental to connect to how did I get off center from what really is meaningful for me and then connecting to something bigger than yourself. I love that. Thank you so very much. Uh, Smita, would you like to add anything to, mm -hmm. to that? I think along the uh, lines that Dr. Ramanjita mentioned, yoga is such a holistic practice. We have various practices and various areas and components of health that is important. And uh, not just because I'm a yoga practitioner or a therapist, but in general, yoga is such a holistic science and uh, I would like to emphasize that yoga is a way of life. So it encompasses various components and pillars of health. Thank you. So um, in your practice, Dr. Ramandeda, you see many patients with major side effects of treatment, right? Um, so uh, tell us how, you know, what are the major side effects that you typically see in your patients? And how does yoga or how may yoga address each of one of these? Well, each one would be a big task. Um, and let me start by saying um, yoga research is an evolving field. And the uh, 
randomized clinical trials are few, and the phase two studies are growing in number all the time, exponentially. I will also state that uh, to me, practicing yoga is a personal experience and that it isn't for everyone. And uh, and it requires trying it on yourself to see if it's going to work. Now, in terms of the patients that I see, there are all sorts of symptoms, but the main ones I see in ovarian cancer patients are fatigue. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the physical ones, uh, neuropathy, yes. um, sometimes some trouble with their counts, like their bone marrow counts, uh, obviously hair loss, which yoga can't help with. And then... <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what other ones, and this is post-treatment. So the overcomers, if they're post-treatment, those are the main post-treatment ones. Um, because of the neuropathy, it may cause them to be less physically active and thus maybe a little bit less able to do activities of daily living and um, a frustration with a loss of the things that they like to do. Mm -hmm. And then on the mental side, I think that overcomers, most likely experience an existential worry that it's going to come back. Yeah. So now how does yoga help with those things? Yes. Um, so in terms of uh, actual scientific studied evidence about yoga, um, there are a few new recommendations where it is particularly helpful for anxiety, depression, it is also helpful for fatigue, mm -hmm. nausea, um, uh, pain in certain circumstances. And um, I'm trying to think, Smith, am I forgetting anything? I think those are the main ones. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, using it, it, how would I uh, use it with my patients in a number of ways? And it depends on what the patient's experiencing, but specifically anxiety, depression, existential stress um, are areas where I think yoga is particularly helpful. Mm -hmm. And it is about calming the mind. Like I said, uh, for me, where it's been helpful is to be able to find a pause and step back and think about why am I upset? Um, what, in, uh, for instance, I want something to be a certain way and it's not, or I don't want something to be a certain way and it is, yeah. or I'm fearing for my life, um, or I feel isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. Those are areas where the philosophy of yoga is very helpful. And the first few steps of that are getting out of your head, mm -hmm. starting by getting into your body moving your body, breathing and changing the energy that you're feeling and that you're giving off, mm -hmm. um, and then withdrawing so that you can, as as the, the philosophy says, see your true self, not yeah. the one that's guided by your ego or what you compare something to or don't want. Um, and in a very physical, um, practical sense for patients who have neuropathy, I believe that anything that's strength building, uh, especially in the legs, is particularly helpful in avoiding falls. And the, you know, you can tell people to go and walk, and that's beautiful, especially if you walk and think beautiful thoughts um, while you're doing it. But the practice of yoga is so internal in the what you're feeling and what you're moving. And also there's an imagery to it, at least when I practice, of strength in yourself that um, allows you to build up those muscles of your legs so that you can be less likely to fall. And through all of this, when you're wasting energy worry, worrying, so uh, really the misuse of your energy, you're exhausted. And if you can stop exhausting yourself with this misuse of energy, then you may find yourself to be less fatigued and able to sleep better. So those are my thoughts. That's wonderful. And I was I was just thinking as you were speaking is sometimes it's the first step which becomes difficult for many of us to take. But once we get take that first step towards yoga therapy, it sounds like it can really do wonders to your system like inside and out. So thank you for sharing that. Smitha, would you 
Would you like to add anything to what she- Along the same her? lines that Dr. La Ramanita mentioned, um, yoga brings a deep systemic harmony, you know, yeah. with enhancing that mind-body connection that we need. And for many patients, they are at many different places in terms of experiencing symptoms, cancer burden, or where they are in their you know, physical ability to perform. So the adaptability of yoga can actually really address many needs, bringing a deep systemic intelligence and harmony within the body and mind, uh, thereby reducing symptom burden and addressing you know, so many issues that patients face when they're going through cancer. Okay. Thank you. So <laughs> in terms of yoga, moving into the cancer care guidelines, right? So mm -hmm. what should our overcomers know in asking their care team about the uh, availability of yoga during their treatment process? I know that this is not standard of care yet, it, while I feel like it should be. So share your thoughts on that uh, with us, uh, please. And and when I say patients or overcomers, I mean, just not just locally and nationally, but globally across the world. So. So um, you mentioned part of guidelines. So I, I pulled them out so I didn't um, state anything incorrectly, uh, but in, I'm trying to make sure I have the year here. It just recently um, published in major journals, the ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology and Society of Integrative Oncology published guidelines regarding where we can incorporate yoga based on clinical trials. And then we'll get into what that means in just a second. But specifically, most of the research has been done with breast cancer. Now, MD Anderson has done some wonderful things um, with head and neck patients, um, meditation for, for caregivers, and, um, and multiple other trials that are ongoing uh, right now. In fact, Smitha can maybe talk about one of hers that is just starting off, and we're just finishing up a trial together on cervical cancer. But uh, the idea, at least through the research that's been published, is that it is specifically helpful for aromatase inhibitor or, or hormone-related um, aches in the joints, specifically for breast cancer patients. Mm -hmm. But in both breast cancer patients and other cancer patients, there is good evidence for using it um, both during treatment for anxiety um, and also post-treatment for anxiety and then also for depression, pre and post, um, for both breast cancer and other patients. Um, and then this is only within cancer patients, but there's a lot of good research specifically related to chronic pain and low back pain specifically related to yoga, which uh, hasn't specifically been studied in cancer patients, but that data is out there in the non-cancer population. The problem that we're working on, I'm not gonna call it a problem, the challenge, uh, is that this is an evolving field. Yeah. It's not a new field. It's been around for thousands of years. Right. But as we move through our modern way of approaching things, um, we have to define what yoga means. And so these, these studies often use the word yoga. And the question is, what does that mean? And so I think Smitha will break this down, but it should involve three components. And I'm going to let her tell you about them after I say them, but specifically a physical component, a respiratory or breathwork component, and a meditation component. And I'm going to stop and let her kind of talk a little bit more about like what that means in these trials. Okay. So when we talk about using different tools of yoga therapy, as Dr. Ramendra mentioned, you know, it's it's a challenge as well as, uh, you know, a gift that yoga has so many tools, but when publishers are publishing, um, they may not very clearly specify what tools were used or the intervention of the module itself. So the physical uh, aspects of yoga uh, therapy can include asanas, gentle stretching, joint loosening, strength-based practices. These are all essentially or predominantly physical, but also impact both breath and mind. And then there are a whole set of breath-related practices. They're called as pranayama in the yogic science, which actually works not only on empowering your respiratory capacity, but also looking at life force or prana and expanding this component of health as well. And we come to awareness-based practices. In yoga, we call them dhyana dharana. These are meditative practices they are predominantly at the awareness level or at the mind level, but also incorporate components of breathing and physical posturing into it. So any yoga tool or a practice that you see 
will have mind body breath component but depending on the practice itself one can be very predominant very strong and the others kind of like follow along so this again coming back to the adaptability of the yoga practice can be adapted depending on patient strength need and activity levels and taking into many other considerations especially to make the practice safe and accessible for individual cancer patient um, I feel like there are so many components of questions, so I hope I answered part of it. Yes, uh, you did. And, and stop me and, you know, um, ask questions again. Thank you. So, um, so you, it's so, it's, it's, it's interesting. And at the same time, it's very valuable that we are getting into what yoga actually means and what yoga can do in terms of all the levels that you just talked about. So, you know, sometimes we clump yoga with like exercise, like regular exercise, right? It's just yoga slash exercise. So, but we know that it's different. So tell us how yoga is different from regular um, exercise. And I know that you have been involved in some trials that, that to improve the quality of life and physical function with uh, yoga. And so what should our overcomers know about these trials ongoing and how may they sign up if they're interested? Ooh, that was a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually the one asking too many questions, but you know, <laughs> it's such a fascinating topic too. Well, let me say a couple of things. I don't want to discount yoga, just plain old what we think of as yoga, because I'll, even for myself, a yoga class at a studio that matches your what you need at the time is a great thing to do if you're able to do it. And um, and part of that is because there is, even though there are minor components, there are those three components. It may not be as broad, but usually you use that ujjayi kind of deep yogic breathing throughout your practices in a regular class. So you are doing the breathing, you are doing the movement. And although it's usually short, there is a short meditative um, shavasana resting to allow all that energy to kind of even out over the course of your body. And there are times as I, I mean, where I really started to say this, there's something here. I can give an example is I would round on patients on a Saturday morning and I would experience everything that they were going through. And I went through it with my normal kind of way of doing it. And I, I remember multiple times, you know, feeling quiet enough during Shavasana to have tears finally kind of come out and be able to connect with something other than all the little things I was trying to do. So I don't want to discount that there's something there, but what's different with what we're talking about is that there is a medical assessment going on. Yeah. And so you're looking at what you have some knowledge about cancer and cancer patients. You have more than like a 200 hour yoga teacher understanding. And you're saying what kind of symptoms, just like you asked, what kind of symptoms do these patients have? Not everyone has them. Some do, some don't, but it, it requires you to assess that patient and then design a protocol using yogic tools to, to help them move into that quiet space um, and get what they need out of it. Um, so the trials are designed specifically for groups of patients at specific times, like pre-treatment, during treatment, after treatment, and a specific cancer type. So for instance, what a, a patient with ovarian cancer experiences, usually there's no radiation involved. Usually it's chemotherapy. It's a lot of neuropathy. It's a lot of GI issues. It's very different than, for instance, a cervical cancer patient who may have more pelvic pain in a different kind of way or bleeding or, or um, changes, different kinds of changes. So when we sit down and when Smitha as a yoga therapist sits down with usually Dr. Cohen at MD Anderson to design a protocol, she is taking all that into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and how do patients get involved? Um, they're usually, they should be approached within their cancer uh, area. So most of them are done um, in a particular place, although some of them are done multi-center. Um, they, if they're in, for instance, head and neck, they'll be approached. If they're in breast, they'll be approached. And, and for instance, our cervix cancer patients were recently approached. Um, and then we're hoping to launch something for ovarian cancer patients very soon that will be part of a prehabilitation program. 
mm-hmm. to prepare them for their surgeries if their surgeries are, follow, are, are following chemotherapy. So that's what we're working on now. And so um, you, I was intrigued by the fact that, you know, uh, something's coming for the ovarian patients. So mm-hmm. where, where can they look up all that information and where should they go if they're interested to mm-hmm. sign up? Well, they can't sign up yet. It's probably many months away. Um, But what will happen is if they are seen at our institution and they are candidates for, you know, as I'm sure you've talked about, some people get surgery up front, some people get uh, chemotherapy first. The patients who are getting chemotherapy first have a number of reasons for getting it that way. Um, And we want to maximize that time using a yogic yoga therapy approach to help patients get mentally, physically, and respiratory system prepared for their surgery, perhaps even with a little mindfulness. Um, And that's, you know, we um, are working on putting that through. We'd like to look at the microbiome during that as well, because yoga philosophy also uh, goes along with this very plant-based diet um, and some of the things that we've learned about uh, the importance of having a beautiful microbiome and how you respond to therapy is, is what we're focusing on. So we really hope to get this off the ground. It's in its planning phases now, and we were lucky enough to have a donor to get us started, uh, but we're we're working on that right now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Smita, would you like to add anything to that? I think along the lines of yoga and physical exercises, something that Dr. Ramandaja emphasized very clearly is it's not against or versus, but physical activity is very important. Staying physical active uh, is one of the most important pillars of health. And we as a nation are actually, you know, behind with our sedentary habits. So physical activity is extremely important, but where yoga really makes a difference is in its mindfulness and awareness-based aspects. And while physical activity is extremely useful, the component of mind-body connection that yoga brings in, brings in a deeper nervous system balance, enhancing the systemic intelligence. Mm-hmm. So there is more resiliency built for us at all levels. And most importantly, as patients go through a very difficult and challenging treatment and post-treatment time, that mental resiliency or the mental health aspect is so important for us to stay motivated to you know, have the right choices. So yoga brings in these aspects that can be a great add-on to the physical activity as well as contributing to a very good physical activity as well. So I just want to emphasize that to our listeners that you know, all these comes together in that synergistic model. Thank you. So um, I, I was just reading an article or an interview where you said, uh, Smita, that almost no hospital in the US has a yoga therapist as part of the clinical team. Um, mm-hmm. Talk to us about this issue and tell us about your role as a yoga therapist and how do you help our overcomers and patients on a regular basis? Uh, so just to start off with access to yoga therapy across cancer hospitals in United States, I think there are a lot of hospitals that are offering this for their patients. What I very specifically meant is yoga therapists being part of a clinical team where you work hand in hand with other integrative medicine practitioners, most importantly, a medical physician and a medical PA or APP overseeing this this whole system that works together to address the patient needs is not a system that is available at every hospital. And I say that this is very unique to MD Anderson and thanks to our leadership that we have had great uh, encouragement to actually bring an open a yoga therapy clinic to see inpatients and outpatients. So in this um, modeled approach where there is a team of professionals looking at you in integrative medicine, specifically at MD Anderson, we are able to evaluate individual patient needs And also we are able to recommend actually specific therapies that are required. And yoga therapy can be one such uh, offer to our patients who come through the integrative medicine doors. And in my practice at MD Anderson, I'm able to actually address acute inpatient needs. And these can be when we we know that when patients are admitted in patients, their pain is really high, their symptom burden, that's why they're unable to get discharged from the hospital. 
So, and they're mostly in bed. They're bed bound, unable to actually carry out a lot of their physical activities or needs on their own. So yoga therapy can be a great um, you know, add on at this time, bringing more maybe gentle practices, bed bound practices, chair yoga practices, meditative awareness based practices, and not to mention breath work. Breathing can do a lot for bed bound patients uh, who are unable to physically do a lot and even getting their respiratory capacity high. And I know uh, Dr. Ramendra is uh, very passionate about breath work and what it can do to our inpatients. So, you know, um, she can add more. But uh, this is something that is unique, and I think this has to continue to um, other hospitals because one of the challenges with yoga therapy is accessibility. Can patients access this? And I don't know if it is too quick to jump in, but there are a, a host of actually uh, barriers or challenges that we need to overcome to make this more accessible, this very important therapy more accessible to patients who are in dire need. So that was actually my next question too. <laughs> that was a great segue to the to the next question I was going to ask is, you know, what are the current barriers to adopting yoga as part of standard care that you see? And uh, what are your guidance, I mean, both, both you and Dr. Amon Data, what would you say in terms of how we could overcome those? So uh, this is a great question as well, and not one that we're going to be able to answer completely here. Um, but what we can say again, this is an evolving field, not a, a it is yoga means many things to many people. You know, we've been talking about yogic practices and breath work, and yet if you go look up yoga, there are people who call it all sorts of different things. Ashtanga yoga, Hatha yoga, mm -hmm. Baptist yoga, uh, um, I don't know, yin, yin yoga, all sorts of things. And there are many people uh, um, who have a different definition of what that means. And there are old ancient texts that tell us, suggest specific movements and breath work and behaviors for certain conditions. And those need to be explored a little bit more. And what we do know is the ones that have guided us for the SIO, ASCO um, um, guidelines, specifically with anxiety and depression and pain related to aromatase inhibitors, as well as benefits that have been shown in nausea and fatigue. And I think there's a few others. Um, and, and so how do we get that in is we continue to do research. We continue to work out what best practices are. We make sure that people are guided as to the safety. So for instance, there are certain things, I'll give a good example, is like osteoporosis. As you get older, there are maybe some special things that you need to avoid doing um, to risk injury to bones. Um, and, um, and where that needs to go is um, it needs to be brought to the insurance companies at some point. And then the insurance companies can pay for it. So for instance, at our institution, we offer free services to our patients. We have some that are already online and then we have classes um, that we offer a few times a week. And we offer some meditation called Yoga Nidra as well as um, Smitha teaches breath work twice a, twice a month. But outside of that, to get a personalized service, there is a, a payment involved. And that is something uh, that is not yet covered by insurances, and it is something that we are working as an as a national organization uh, towards. One of the institution, one of the groups that Smith and I are involved in is in the Society of Integrative Oncology. Another major group working in this area is the International Association of Yoga Therapists, um, and then I guess probably the Yoga Alliance is also working in this area to say, "Hey, we've got." proof and evidence that this is helpful to people. And it's it requires no machines. <laughs> we have everything that we need. It's not a high cost uh, thing. And it's something that can be taught via Zoom in many cases. Mm -hmm. So um, the that's where we are. We are moving in that direction. These and these guidelines are the first step. The next step is uh, kind of almost board certifying probably some of the yoga therapy programs and it's working in that direction. And then bringing safe best practices to our patients and making sure that it is accessible to everyone. We definitely don't want this to be only for people who can pay. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So 
as you're talking about other barriers, I'm going to ask you in terms of adoption, right? Do you see that as a barrier from the patient perspective? Do you see that, you know, patients are not as interested or, I mean, because to me, all these, you know, logistical hindrances are there, but if from the patient perspective, the, the interest needs to be there as well to be able to, you know, circumvent all of this. So tell us about your experience on, on you know, adoption and how do the, you know, overcomers it's real. react to. Yeah. It's kind of what we said in the beginning when you asked what the definition of yoga was for me, because many people think they know what yoga is and it is forward bends, touch your toes, handstands, crazy Instagram pictures, um, and a lot of work. And also for some, it, it there is a concern that there is um, a religious aspect. And um, I think that to deny this is a spiritual um, practice would be incorrect um, and a disservice. And to me, I guess, uh, I always tell patients, I think Patanjali's Yoga Sutras are the best self-help book ever written. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, there are some barriers. And patients, to me, seem to be a lot more approachable when you talk about it in terms of a mind-body approach, mind-body-spirit approach. But Smitha, you you see them usually after they've said yes. So, um, but we've definitely had people who, when we offered them the trials, like, yeah, no, yoga is not for me. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, thank you for clarifying that because, you know, I was just thinking that sometimes that is the biggest barrier that we have to cross to be able to convince mm -hmm. the patient that it is actually worth trying. So yeah. And it's not for everyone, but yeah. Smitha, what, do you, what do you have to say about all that? <laughs> yes, I think in terms of patients buy-in, I do say that yoga is one of the most popular wellness-based approach with a growing number of practitioners, not only in the United States, but worldwide. We have data 10 years ago, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and we see every year the yoga and meditation practitioners continue to grow even when you compare it with other mind-body practices like Tai Chi, Qi Gong and others. Yeah. So in general, there is this upward trend of many people coming to practice yoga. This is also the case in our own integrated medicine program. We have offered many different group classes in the past and I've been at MD Anderson for 10 to 15 years now and yoga continues to be the most popular. We have increased the number of classes, number of people, and there is still more demand. Now, is there a buy-in within uh, patients to do yoga within acute patients? Probably when they're so very symptomatic, it's maybe not their first choice, but when the conversation of what can you do to help yourself and build a healthy lifestyle, many patients quick yoga very you know easily. There may be, in again, my years of working with hundreds if not thousands of cancer patients, a small population that does hesitate for the spiritual religious aspect of yoga. But from my own experience, I'll also say, I always invite them to say, try a session. If it's not for you, it's not for you. And everybody who has tried the session never said not for me. They have come back. So this conversation of, is there a spiritual aspect to it? Absolutely. Is there a cultural aspect to it? Absolutely. But to embrace the benefits of yoga as a therapeutic approach, you don't have to actually, um, those won't become a hindrance for an individual. So right. if you can really find a yoga teacher, a yoga therapist who can, uh, with all respect, honor your own system and your own spiritual belief system and integrate yoga safely. I've had, uh, you know, um, mainstream patients always tell, I'm closer to my God ever with yoga after my yoga practice. So there is that beautiful aspect to it. I always say, experience, then make the decision. Whatever is your decision. We have many beautiful tools, you know, uh, not just yoga. It can be Tai Chi, it can be Qigong, it can be a different form of prayer. So I always, when I work with patients, I ask them about their own mind-body connection, mind-body practices, making sure to encourage a, a connection or a practice that they already have and working with them to integrate different yoga practices 
uh, safely to help them in that difficult time. That's beautiful. Thank you. And so, um, you know, while I, we stay on this, uh, you know, I had a couple of questions on trials and studies, but I'll come to that later. But um, could you show us some breath work or, you know, meditative practices um, that our overcomers could safely, you know, try at home? And it can be one of the things that we talked about, the barriers, right? Sometimes it can be too complicated or uh, too cumbersome for <laughs> them to you know keep doing it on a daily basis so but something which is easy takes few minutes of your day but yet gives you that inner peace and calm um is there anything that you would like to perhaps uh, share with us that our overcomers could um then practice sure, sure. thank you Arunsi. and i know yoga is such a beautiful elaborate practice so i would say this is a very small trailer or a very small taste of what we can do so in the next few minutes, we'll just do this for a couple minutes. I invite you all to take a comfortable posture. And I'm assuming that you all are on chair like I am. And if you're not, I invite you to find a chair, find a seat that is comfortable for you. And from all the different thoughts and experiences that we are right now, just bring your awareness to your body to here and now. And begin to bring awareness maybe to your feet and see if your feet can touch the floor, just gently pressing, bringing awareness to your knees, thighs, hips. Becoming aware of the lower part of your body, feeling your sit bones on which you're sitting right now. Lengthening your spine, creating this beautiful space in your heart center, in your abdomen. Relaxing your shoulders, aligning your head and neck. And as you arrive at the body, notice any sensations that you can feel. Bringing awareness to breath. without having to change anything. Just notice the fact that you're breathing right now. If it feels comfortable, with curiosity, explore your breath a little more. Maybe taking a nice breath in, maybe the deepest breath today so far. And as you pause at the top, begin to slowly exhale, letting go all the air and maybe gently sinking in your abdominals. Repeat that if that's comfortable. Inhale and exhale. So from passive observation, you're gently shifting to gentle and mindful breathing. Inhale for another round or two. Every inhalation followed by exhalation. And as you begin to explore your breath a little more, we can shift to diaphragmatic breathing or abdominal breathing. Bring your focus to your abdomen. And as you inhale, you take a nice deep breath in and begin to exhale. And see if you can take a moment to exhale fully. Maybe your exhalation is a little longer than the inhalation. If it's time to take that next deep breath in, Inhale and go for that complete exhalation. As you continue the diaphragmatic breathing, your breathing in and breathing out ratio can be equal. Preferably, your exhalation is a little long. Two to three counts of inhale and maybe 
three, four, five, or even up to six scans of XA. Gently encourage yourself, breathing in and out. And to finish off this breath work, we'll do humming honeybee breath, a simple sound-based breath practice. And this in yoga is called Brahmhari Pranayama. To do this practice, please bring the tip of your tongue to your upper palate. Rest your tongue against the hard palate. Close your mouth. You're also deeply inhaling to begin this practice. When you're ready to exhale, make a gentle humming sound. And two things to remember. Focus on your abdomen and you're doing that diaphragmatic breathing. Try to slowly release the breath and try and exhale longer. Anytime I say longer, you're not stressing yourself. Let the effort be gentle. Do your best. Let's try that for a couple of rounds. Inhale. Tongue up. Pause. One more. Inhale when ready. Pause. Notice any sensations. Humming is a sound practice. You may also notice vibrations. Experience it as a sound. You're welcome to continue for another round or two. As you complete the practice, just take another moment to notice what your experience is right now, how a short practice has changed your mind-body breath experience. Maybe your body is a little more rested. Your breathing is a little more rhythmic deeper and there is awareness a sense of centeredness and to finish off I would like to add that even though this is a short practice easily you can practice it while you're waiting for your doctor's appointment before having your food just any time you want that mindful moment a mindful connection you can use these practices and there are so many such tools uh, but smaller uh, little ones that you can fit in also are equally beneficial, like an hour of uh, yoga practice. I know, Rizzi, we have limited time. So, you know, back to our conversation. That's wonderful. Thank you so very much. I feel so calm and relaxed already. Although I'll tell you with my cough, it was a little difficult to do the exhalation. But I had a question on the when you're exhaling. Um, that is from the mouth, right? And not from the nose. Typically, all um, yoga practices, you know, traditionally recommend not the breathing, but for few practices where mouth breathing is specifically used. But working with a lot of our patient populations, especially if they're very symptomatic, not breathing can be challenging for them, in which case using mouth breathing instead is okay. And this is what I, as a yoga therapist, adapt these practices to meet the patient needs depending on what they can. And in a very systematic way, we improve them from mouth breathing to nostril breathing to single nostril breathing or various aspects that can be beneficial for them. So that's a great question. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Smitha. So um, we talked a little bit about the trials and studies that you are conducting on the mind-body intervention techniques. Um, is there anything that we missed talking about that you would like to add in terms of um, all the trials and the work that you have ongoing? So maybe one um, 
one understanding to add on, especially for our patients would be yoga therapy practices. Many times people understand it as a very big feel good practice added to your cancer journey. It makes you feel good which is true, but also it can be very specifically symptom specific or treatment intent to treat specific kind of a model that a good yoga therapist can actually develop working with you. So one of my experiences has been, you know, maybe working with head and neck cancer patients where they have high symptom burden and they're going through post treatment radiation to the extent that patients cannot swallow food and they can have, you know, symptomatic, you know, high symptom burden, people are losing 20, 30 pounds in a week or two. So really highly symptomatically challenging, you know, stage. And when we added yoga to this patient population with such high symptom burden, we were able to see that they were able to retain weight, retain their range of motion or movement. Sometimes surgeries are required to correct these procedures. So I want to bring back to this to specifically, you know, doctors, nurses, care providers, and for patients that you can use yoga for very specific, you know, uh, addressing very specific symptom burden. And it can be very, very useful, beneficial, especially when added it along with the uh, conventional cancer treatment, may it be chemo, may it be radiation or surgery. So just to emphasize that and bringing this connection um, of building, um, taking your yoga patients who also can actually, you know, embrace yoga as a practice in their cancer treatment, but, but also communicating with the frontline doctors and nurses. And we are so lucky to have Dr. Ramangadana, like doctors and herself on our team who are great advocates for yoga therapy. Uh, but this can actually improve the accessibility recommendation and improving funding and bringing these patients, these practices to patients who are finally in need. Well, that is a big area, like trying to, um, there's always a lot of interest in uh, drug trials, which are incredibly important. And though managing your symptoms, specifically the ones in here during your treatment and after, to me, over the years of, of doing this is equally important. And though there is not as much funding for this kind of work. Um, and so it, we are very lucky to have Smitha. We are lucky to have um, actually a, quite a number of good researchers at our institution who are focused in this area. Smitha being one of them and she's launching one of her her pro focus projects right now with them um, with uh, leukemia right leukemia patients stem cell uh, transplantation stem any cell patient transplant. can actually see yeah them. and um and this desire to bring what we feel ha has so much to offer again without any tools uh to calm the mind when things are so high anxiety and high tense situations. Um, I can't think of a more important tool. And so we we look forward to building our program and uh, and networking with other people who are interested. And that's what we're working on now in the SIO and uh, and through MD Anderson. And, and thank you for bringing so much light to this because I completely agree with you in the sense that, you know, I mean, unless we understand the mind-body connection and the microbiomes, you also had mentioned that earlier. I mean, those are the fundamentals, right? I mean, we cannot, I mean, clinical trials are great when new drugs and new treatments, all of that, of course we need, but to cleanse out from inside out is, is so mm -hmm. important. And so the more focus we bring to this, I feel like, the more we can do for our patient community and not just cancer, like any, any state yeah. any disease, right? So yeah. aging, any, anything, <laughs> exactly anything. Yeah. And it's do. funny, you know, Runcy, that there's all this, I mean, I'm all, I'm, I'm in an academic center. I'm a scientist. And though uh, a lot of what we're studying has such a basis in things that are thousands of years old, you know, we can study the microbiome and know that it's important now and though, you know, an apple a day has been a saying for many, many years <laughs> and plant-based is part of a yogic lifestyle. And we know these things and I guess we need proof, but the truth is if you practice these things, you will feel better. 
Exactly. You will feel better. And then you'll know. I have personally used these th techniques in my own life. And I can tell you that I have felt a difference. I mean, I have seen, not just felt, I've seen the numbers. I've seen the difference mm -hmm. that, that these kinds of, you know, interventions can bring to your life. So, so important. Um, mm -hmm. so Dr. Amandita, you, you know, I've also written a book, so you have done a lot of things in your life. So I wanted to talk to you, ask you rather that, you know, you have focused a lot on spiritual well-being, right? So tell us about the physical, I mean, and the emotional benefits that spiritual well-being can bring to our overcomers while, while they are going through the cancer experience. And what are the uh, physiological or psychological outcomes of oh. this in ovarian cancer survivors and you know also um you know your so in our few minutes left <laughs> i know I mean... ask the, the question of life right um the question of life but i i think what i would say is um one of the things i think we know these things but the yoga philosophy has helped me in this way um it is is given me the words to explain it. So, so for instance, when you are hurting inside, the yogic philosophy says there's a reason for your suffering, right? So what is it? It's because you, like I said, you want something that, that you can't have, or you wish something was a different way, or you're clinging towards, you know, maybe a fear of death or, or clinging to that, or you've lost this connection um, about who you really are. And there are a number of different words that we're not going to get into for that by kind of recognizing those things. So being, you know, the, the yogic approach, and I, we didn't even talk about this, but Smitha is, you know, well-versed in, and she's the one that's taught me all these things. It's that it's a different way of looking at a person instead of just really looking at their physical aspects. You, oh, you look at that first, but then you look at their their energetic work and you look at what they're struggling with and then where that basis of struggling may have come from. And you try, um, you, you have to remove all those superficial things that are causing suffering to get to that area of peace. And it's really, like I've said this to people, it is a minute to minute practice. You don't arrive and then you're like, Yay, I'm there. It is more the recognition that it is a minute to minute, second to second practice. Being around other people who are doing that same kind of work helps a lot. Um, and uh, and the opportunities are huge. So I guess, I mean, I, I think all of these things are important and many different spiritual bases kind of say similar things. And some of that comes through chanting or saying prayers and singing and calming the mind to to say i would prefer it to be this way but it's not and the struggle and the pain is because of me constantly wanting it the way it's not so the tools of equanimity i guess are what yoga gives you doesn't say i mean it's like physical therapy if you just do the practice once a week or like once every couple of weeks, it doesn't really work that well. Yeah, You have to kind of, it's got to be on there. And one of the most wonderful things that I, I feel like I've been able to do because of Smitha is I, I get to teach one of the classes that we offer here uh, a week and it's the highlight of my week. And part of the reason that it's the highlight is that I start thinking like on Monday, the class is on Friday. I start thinking on Monday, like, what is the intention? Like, what is the lesson or what is the thing that I'd like to think about? And it might be a song or something, but it, but that's part of it. It's like coming in contact with your intention um, and trying to refocus. And you forget. I mean, I'll forget. I'll get in the car and someone will cut me off and I'll forget. But, <laughs> but I'll try to come back to it over and over again. And, uh, you know, having people in your life like Smitha or people who are doing the work or trying to do some of these um, training programs are, are really um, important to have, important to have around. I mean, su such a great discussion. And I, you are right. We, I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> yeah, we will we'll have to invite you back for more because it's just, just very fascinating. So just though, I mean, as we close, um, 
I've asked you a lot of questions. Is there anything that I missed that you would like to share, which is, you know, top of mind? Only thing I'll share is that um, I, when I describe myself, sometimes I call myself a wannabe yogi because I haven't arrived and uh, I might have to come around the block a couple more times before I get there. But I said, you know, I, I think that a lot of this philosophy helps you recenter oftentimes before you cause drama or illness for yourself. And the the pause between doing the action or saying the thing becomes longer the more you practice. And um, and that's really, I think, what you're looking for is that pause to say, wait a minute, let me let me think about what I'm about to do or say or eat or do, you know, that helps you get back to why am I here and what is my intention? Thank you. Smith. Try it. <laughs> Would you like to add anything to that? Along the same lines, that, like Dr. Ramandita said, I invite people to try and embrace yoga as a way of life um, for themselves. It can be a simple practice that they dedicate every day or a few times a week or even once a week to start with. No small baby step is you know, wasted. So just um, really try it. And once you know, uh, what you're doing, it's it's hard not to do it anymore. So really, um, without embracing or without trying, you can't, you know, explain. I always go back to this experience, you know, um, idea of you cannot explain what is sweet or what is hot or what is spicy without even trying it. So we're all trying to explain to people what yoga is, but if they have not tried it for themselves, it's really hard to put it in words. So I invite people, especially everyone who is challenged by cancer, either directly or, or as a patient, or even by caring for others that might be impacted by it. Either way, yoga is a great practice for everyone. So uh, please try it. Thank you. And um, and just in closing, and Dr. Amandita knows I asked this question at all of my episodes, what message of overcoming would you like to share with our overcomers listening? Mm -hmm. um. Hopefully some of these techniques will be helpful for you, but it would be to, when you're suffering, to find that quiet space inside, calm the fluctuations of your mind, which may be continually causing your suffering and, and find that quiet space, perhaps moving first through breath and movement and a connection and and uh, hopefully that will give you the strength to continue overcoming. Thank you, Dr. Amandita. What about you, Smitha? I would say yoga is a very accessible practice. Coming back to what I said before, it's a very accessible practice, does not depend on flexibility body type. If you can breathe, if you can you know, be here and feel, yoga is for you. So just bringing it back really strongly, um, try yoga, practice yoga, make yoga fun if you like. Wonderful. Thank you so very much uh, to both of you for uh, for this fascinating discussion today. We, you know, I'm sure uh, we, you know, all of us that are watching, we learned so much from both of you. So thank you for your time. And overcomers, we hope this was beneficial for you. We, we This was such a fascinating discussion and we learned so much. And if you have any questions about yoga therapy and um, anything at all, please let us know and we'll try to get it addressed uh, by these experts. And we'll be back with the next episode of Connect Over Coffee very soon. Until then, you keep inspiring and keep overcoming. Thank you and bye.